very pleased to welcome Joanna Hodge. And Joanna Hodge is a philosopher, a doctor in philosophy. Uh, she got her um, PhD, I'm sorry, from the University of Oxford uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the 80s with a uh, PhD uh, dedicated to Martin, Martin Heidegger uh, on uh, accounts of truth, a study of sign and sight, uh, which she completed after having um, studied both in, uh, in the UK but also in, uh, in Berlin. Um, she has uh, taught widely in several uh, British universities uh, before arriving to at the Manchester Metropolitan University where she has um, occupied uh, several positions uh, and lectured on feminist and political theory uh, before becoming a reader and then a professor. She has um, also served at, on the philosophy panel of the UK HEFC research assessment in 2001 and 2008, and she is currently uh, part of the Department of History, Politics and Philosophy in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. She has two, she has several publications, but I would like to mention two monographs, which are Heidegger and Ethics, uh, published in 95, and then Derrida on Time, um, and a third one, which is apparently in the making, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, which is the return of the thing, reading Jean-Luc Nancy. But what uh, Joanna will be presenting to us today are her moonlighting um, activities, <laughs> I've learned a new word, on the writings of Michel Serre. Please welcome Joanna. Thank you very much, and it's, <coughs> it's a great pleasure to be here in Vienna uh, to talk about Michel Serre, who, as um, the introduction suggested, is someone I read, as it were, in my spare time at night, as opposed to for my more formal duties at my institution. Uh, we haven't started teaching Michel Serre yet, and for reasons, in a sense, I'm in part exploring uh, in my remarks. I mean... I find the question of how to read Michel Serre exceptionally interesting and problematical, and which conversations to put him into, similarly so, and so my remarks will perhaps rotate about those two questions, how to read Michel Serre and which conversations to put him into in order to open up his texts for people who may find them baffling, bewildering. Uh, I guess my remarks, too, would take place somewhere between uh, preoccupation with an archaeology of knowledge on the one hand and an architectonic of reason on the other. And when um, uh, Vera was opening the session, emphasising the notion of the in lieu, the in place of, the instead of, I was thinking that maybe these remarks should be thought of as an instead of the philosophy of history, that somewhere between Foucault and an archaeology of knowledge and uh, a Kantian architectonic of reason, something else is on its way that will permit us no longer to be brought back under the domain of a discipline uh, which perhaps is no longer functioning, uh, that called the philosophy of history. So that's the, as it were, bridge from what I wrote two weeks ago to what's happened in the last 24 hours since we got here to Vienna. So Vera, thank you very much for bringing us here. Um, it always uh, puts the remarks into some other frame from those in which you originally uh, wrote them down. So, um, on statues, nomads, and other modes of subjectivation, thinking with Michel Serre, <coughs> My paper is going to provide a brief introduction to these notions of statue nomad and to a series of proposals concerning a possible third term articulating the space between. Foundations and multiplicities, folds and series are possible third terms to articulate that space. My main text is going to be Michel Serre's Statues, the second book of foundations from 1987. Uh, my discussion is supposed to serve for me as a bridge to considering connections between notions of triads, 
as chance conjunctions, say on noise and on interference, and the vicissitudes, it's a hard word even for English, the vicissitudes of translation. And there's something kind of interesting that happens when Sarah is translated into a British English or translated into an American English, about which I'd be happy to talk a bit more about maybe in the questions. So these three terms, triads, noise, translation, as prompts for reconfiguring classical notions of subjectivity and objectivity, concerns with causes and things. So the task is to show how statues and nomads are not to be thought of as competing notions, but rather as overlapping if discontinuous contributions to gaining access to what remains to be made thinkable in the flows of multiplicity, intermittence and turbulence in which information streams currently clamour for attention. So my title may be expanded to On Statues and Nomads on Folds and Series. Folds and Nomads then being terms which evoke the legacy of Gilles Deleuze, whereas statues and series perhaps might be thought as terms playing key roles for an articulation of Michel Serre for a public that has not yet noticed he's there. <laughs> so a discussion in three sections, an introduction concerned with a concept of foundation and a connection to a notion of grammar, which will pick up on some questions about natural language. Uh, a relocation of the discussion in terms of monads and uh, the notion of Dasein, that is putting the discussion back into an encounter between Leibniz and Heidegger, which it seems to me takes place in South text. And then a suggestion that uh, in place of the so-called philosophy of history, we need to think of some kind of transmission and transition between the notion of geophilosophy in what is philosophy of Deleuze and Gattari and the notion of hominescence to which Sayre offers us as a possible new focus for thinking. So Michel Serre's 1987 study, Statues, the Second Book of Foundations, ends by staging an encounter between apparently opposing figures, the multiple voyager Hermes, also known as Mercury, messenger of the gods, figured by Serre as bearer of both meanings and noise, and the image of the goddess of the hearth, Hestia, to whom Serre ascribes an etymological linkage to the notion of the episteme, or systems of the knowable. This then almost invisible invocation of Michel Foucault's discussion of an archaeology of knowledge of systems of episteme, his use of that term in the study Les Moules Shows, comically translated into English as the order of things. This might serve then as a complement to the invocation in my title of Deleuze and Gattari's notion of nomads, so maybe it would then become Episteme, statues, nomads. A nomadism or nomadology in their joint writings, Anti Oedipus, Thousand Plateau, and What is Philosophy, which suggests a diversionary exploration of the series epistemology, genealogy, nomadology, a, a temptation which I'm going to resist on this occasion. Serre and Foucault, of course, knew each other when both taught at Clermont Ferrand. I've been told recently that Serre taught Foucault algebra. Serre starting there in 1960 before moving to the Sorbonne in 1969 and to Stanford in 1984. A reading of Serre's more recent text, Hominescence from 2001, Lancan in 2003 and Petit Pousset 2012, complements an emphasis that appears to emerge, an emphasis on immobility and mortuary statuary with a corresponding emphasis on movement, life and metamorphosis. In the latter very slim volume, Petit Pousset, Serre generates the figure of Thumbelina as a 13-year-old female, two-thumb navigator of the internet, capable of greater authority about the current condition of knowledge and the arrival of the new than any more authorised instructor called a philosopher. Serre dates the arrival of Thumbelina, Petit Pousset, as concurrent with the arrival of mobile phones of micro keyboards in France in 1994. But of course, Serre has also been locating the notion of thanatocracy as early as the essay in 1974. 
He's in process then of displacing a notion of an ideal, static figure of humanity to be displaced in favour of an explicitly self-modifying transformational structure in transition, that of hominescence. This then would be the genealogy as a tracing out of processes of a metamorphosis of the species, as opposed to supposing there's a static image of the human. At a later stage of inquiry, it'll be possible to assess differences between such an emphasis on hominescence and that of the geophilosophy as considered by Deleuze and Gattari, shifting the focus for discussion once again to the conjunction statues and hominescence, nomadology and geophilosophy. In addition to the statues and nomads of my title then, and the folds and series of my outline, a further third term, foundation, arrives very emphatically in the 1987 book Statues with the suggestion from the opening pages, which there's my abstract and there's a picture of Michel Serre, I think from the paper that he gave by Skype in Utrecht, I think that's some key terms. The task is to show that these are not competing notions but rather overlapping if discontinuous contributions to gaining access to what remains to be made thinkable in the flows of multiplicity, intermittence and turbulence in which information streams currently clamour for our attention. Discussion in three sections then. And here's my first citation from Statues. The first foundation, that of collectivity, puts the subject in relation with death. The second foundation, of which we don't know whether it precedes or follows the first, ensues from it or deepens it, puts death in relation with the object. The one makes visible a legible face be seen, since languages vie with one another to describe it. The other makes me seen the illegible and silent face of a founding authority that has no name in any language and that assembles the authorities that we cut out under the three names of object, death and subject. <laughs> um, this second book of foundations provides a provisional horizon for these exploratory remarks and Statues Nomads Foundations then a series of terms to begin to articulate, as I say, the space between what appear to be the opposed opposing notions of statue on one hand and nomad on the other. But such a series of terms is put in question by this uncertainty concerning temporal order, about an uncertainty about whether the first foundation proceeds or follows on from the second foundation or conceivably both precedes and succeeds it, so, so the, this so-called second. In the discussion, I shall outline a motivation for shifting the series on to include the terms series, multiplicities, folds, but it's first of all important to say a bit more about this notion of statues as the silent testimony of death in relation with the object. Towards the end of his 1987 text, Sayre indicates that the statue provides an instance which precedes language. Some statues remain indefinitely in silence, sorry, begin citation. Since statues remain indefinitely in silence, the monotheisms of speech and writing move away from them as they do from the underworld, expel them and command their sectarians to hate idols to break them. Thus language takes over their place of origin. Likewise, you will not find in history or tradition any general treatise on sculpture or statues. Language does not speak about silence. Well, some of that might be disputable, but that's the remark that Sarah makes. One contrarian might indeed claim that language speaks only about silence, but that might turn out on closer inspection to be indistinguishable from Sarah's claim. It's important to underline a connection here between the uncertainty with respect to temporal order addressed in Sayre's thinking of foundations and origins and an uncertainty with respect to the workings of grammar in setting up an otherwise volatile temporal order as in some kind of order of series. With the workings of grammar, a certain temporal order is selected out, arriving quietly, perhaps unobserved, unremarked, 
but all the more powerfully for being, for the most part, unobserved and unremarked. Here, then, is a common cause between Serre on the one hand and Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze on the other, who may be detected as providing extended commentaries on the remark from Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols, the Goethe and Demerung, on a connection between grammar and belief in a deity, Nietzsche, I fear we'll never get free of God while we still believe in grammar. Sarah, of course, is not intent in getting free of God, whatever that might have looked like, but rather on reconnecting current thinking to resources of analysis locked away in declarations concerning supposedly defunct religions, those of Isis and Osiris, or the Roman gods, Jupiter, Mars, Quirinus, beggars respectively of sovereignty, open conflict, and the public spectres of manufacture to which he returns on a number of occasions. By contrast, the citation from Statues, the second book of Foundations, which I introduced earlier, it's the Greek gods, Hermes and Hestia, who are the important figures, and Hephaestus arrives for attention, the deity of the smithy, forging weapons and mastering the volcanic forces to come in the Industrial Revolution. So the obstacles to following Sayre's convoluted paths of thinking are, I think, formidable. The shifts back from Latin to Greek and Greek to Latin, pantheon, important to follow. But my attempt here will now be to consider a shift from locating his writings between those of Foucault and Deleuze or between our contemporary irreligion and the Greek preoccupation with their pantheon rather to this location between Leibniz and Heidegger in order to consider the relation to the terms monad and Dasein. So both extending and contracting the historical timeline and putting into focus the problem status of narratives concerning a history of philosophy and how our philosophical problems arrive. So my focus so far has been on the second of the series of publications by Sayre, the above-mentioned statues, the second book of foundations. But the text, of course, sits between a first book of foundations dedicated to the reading of Livy's text on Rome, the founding of the city, and a third book of foundations concerned with the multiple origins of geometry, the three orientations for discussion foundations, then Livy on Rome, the foundation of the city, statues, and the origins of geometry as a topos to which, of course, historians and philosophers have returned on any number of occasions in the last two and a half millennia. The origins of geometry, the third book of foundations, and its very title intimates an encounter with, or indeed challenge to, Husserl's famous paper, The Origin of Geometry, from the 1930s, which, of course, was translated into French and commented on extensively by Jacques Derrida in 1962, and therefore serves as a challenge to any notion of a single origin, a single book of foundations, a single foundation, to any notion of a unitary foundation. While foundations, then, is one possible third term alongside statues and nomads, there are here foundations as an architectural figure and foundations as folds, as multiples, not as fixities and unicities. So the notion of foundation itself is going to start splitting and dispersing itself. I move back then, part two, relocation, monads and Darzan. Locating the writings of Michel Serre between those of G.W. Leibniz and those of Martin Heidegger has the effect of putting a focus on a distance and a proximity between the conjunction, conjunction statues and nomads and the conjunction Dasein and monads. While Serre on statues and foundations may serve as a critical commentary on Heidegger's notion of Dasein, Heidegger, of course, himself returns to readings of Leibniz on a number of significant occasions in ways which suggest that he, Heidegger too, is wrestling with the inheritance of a concept of monadology. The questions to which Heidegger's notions of historicality and of the event fail, I suggest, to provide an adequate answer, is how do the worlds constituting the horizons of determinate existing coalesce into a single unified world in which meanings may be supposed to be extended? Heidegger and Leibniz, though, may be seen as in dispute about how to construct a concept of world, 
a concept, I suggest, which has far less salience for the thinking of Michel Serre for reasons which I think are very interesting and important. The two German philosophers, Leibniz and Heidegger, have emphatically distinct relations both to writing and to language use. Leibniz keen on the challenge of thinking and writing in several different natural languages and on constructing systems of formalization. Heidegger apparently resistant to any such practice of formalization, preferring instead his highly controversial mode of translation as transposition and thereby generating a philosophical idiolect which continues to have power and force, compelling a certain conformity to a series of somewhat doubtful neologisms. Leibniz writes before, and Heidegger writes after the unification of a certain Germany by Bismarck, replacing the Holy Roman Empire which expired one day in August in 1806. For Serre, Heidegger's writings are salient for their emphatic thematizations of death and time. And in his Pantopie de Hermes à Petit Poussette from 2014, the series of interviews, Serre is quite dismissive of Heidegger's thinking of time and death, but clearly from a stance of having grappled with it them over some set of years. Leibniz's legacy perhaps is the more important it's multiple and more open-ended, starting with the doctoral dissertation and carrying through into the current work. As I have remarked, Heidegger too is preoccupied with an inheritance from Leibniz, and so one could perhaps set up quite an interesting uh, triangulation with Heidegger and Serre disputing a certain inheritance of Leibniz. The series for my attention then may then become monads, Dasein, statues, nomads, foundations, and the terms in relation to which a schematization of differences between Leibniz, Heidegger and Serre might then be set out in terms of alternating notions of nothing and nothingness, annihilation and nihilism. Again, in statues, Serre may be found refusing to exclude anything and invoking a different kind of notion of nothingness, a very emphatically different kind of notion of nothingness from that which is so important for the Heideggerian transmission. He invokes a notion of an included as, ex as, ex as opposed to the excluded third as a device for including and for affirming anything that might have otherwise appeared to be the remnant. Open citation... Accepting the third place at risk of exclusion, the instructed third, speaking at once in the language of the irrational and the rational and taking them toward their common silence, aspire simply to the weakness of expelling nothing. What for Heidegger comes to the fore, as is well known, is a shift from a questioning to a forgetting and then to an abandonment of and by being, Seins, Frage, Seins, Vergessenheit, Seins, Verlassenheit, in which series the emphasis shifts gradually from an objective to a subjective genitive. And this grammatical move in part enables and in part obscures the point and blocks the movement of thought. So where once being might have been put in question and opposing of a question of the meaning of being, now being is figured as in the mode of taking leave, in the mode of self-concealment and of a departure, imitating some form of a deus absconditus of a departed god. The movement to be followed through then is from Leibniz's thinking of theodicy to a figuring of kenosis which ends up in a vanishing of the divine, the divine so emptied out into a world that nothing remains. This then would be an inheritance as a victory for nihilism, against which it seems to me that Michel Serre and a reading of Michel Serre can be raised as a standard. Statues and nomads, foundations and nihilism then would be another possible way of continuing the series in order to mobilize Serre as a reading to help us not be overwhelmed by a, a affirmations of nihilism in its various forms. So already here in my remarks, I juxtapose three distinct kinds of movement. A movement of a history of philosophy, Leibniz, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Serre, as opposed to, say, Spinoza, Nietzsche, Bergson, Deleuze, which could then, of course, be integrated in order to include them all rather than set it up as opposition. <laughs> 
There's a movement of concepts and entities and of being in their relatedness one to another. Leibniz, according to their insistence, on a certain bivalence and multiplicity of origins. And there's a series of tectonic shifts in the direction and focus of a philosophical program of inquiry, from a focus on life to a focus on death and back, and then the suggestion that maybe it was never a question of choosing between the two, from entities to a univocal concept of being and back, with the suggestion that maybe it was never a question of choosing between the two. But here, perhaps very importantly, some kind of opposition between a notion of theodicy and a notion of nihilism and some kind of negotiation to be set out between those two. A dispute may be staged, I suggested, between Heidegger and Leibniz on the status of a concept of world, framing the dispute on nothingness, and indeed framing a dispute on the question of privileged languages and forms of grammar. That would introduce a salient feature of Sayre's response to both Heidegger and to Leibniz, an insistence that alongside a thinking of spaces and of times, there must also or has always already been a thinking of matter and of mass as multiple, both preceding and postdating the making of the distinctions between space and time, between spacings and temporalities. Three features of Sayre's writings are important for me here. Firstly, he investigates this parallelogram of forces between Greeks and Jerusalem on one side, which he identifies as oriented towards light, mobility, and an upward movement of the idealization. And on the other side, the Romans and the Egyptians, who he aligns with darkness, death, and commemoration, a preoccupation with foundations and with notions of immortality. Crypts and pyramids figure the latter, whereas ruined temples and gods departing from earthly places figure the former. And perhaps Sayre's enthusiasm and insistence that we do not forget Christianity may be because Christianity can be figured as gaining momentum precisely by a combination of the forces of these two in the Romanization of the messianic message of Jerusalem. Sayre returns to his figure Romans and Egyptians versus Greece and Jerusalem so persistently that I think it's important to bring it out for attention here. A similar space now opening out for reconfiguring idealization and for renegotiating a relation to what is referred to as matter materiality. Sayre sets this up in terms of thinking the local and the global, the fixed and the mobile, the rigid and the flexible, at to which list I, of course, am now adding the statue and the nomad. The second term here, which is important for me in reading Sayre, is this notion of the instructed as opposed to the excluded third. Sayre, of course, invests a number of figures in an attempt to generate a more adequate way of thinking, interdependence and exchanges between apparently opposed forces, from Hermes and Hestia to angels and, of course, the harlequin of the mixed mode, depicted by him in his discussions in Le Tier Instruit, which is translated into English as the troubadour of knowledge. The translators explain their translation thus, marking, marking up for me an important feature, which is the inevitable violence of the translation process. So this is the translator's note at the beginning of the English, or should I say American, <laughs> translation of... Uh, Le Tier Instruit, which comes into um, as the troubadour of knowledge. Uh, the French title of this book, Le Tier Instruit, literally the third instructed one or the instructed third, parallels in French such well-known expressions as Le Tier Etat, uh, the third world, the excluded third, what third. It refers then to the subject of a third kind of instruction outside the dominant first two, outside science, and literary education, or the natural and human sciences. In the text, we've generally translated the phrase literally. The third instructed, however, would have made an unappealing and perplexing book title. The troubadour of knowledge was chosen to reflect Michel Serre's identification of the third, instructed with the figure of the troubadour, his equation of learning and knowing with finding and innovation. Translator's note, uh, Roman number nine. And they point to the section in the second part of this book, 
which includes the troubadour legacy of southern France and which concludes with a section on Serre's discussion of a generative couple of history, death and immortality, and a dependence of innovation and creation on the activities of certain kinds of patronage. So uh, the Troubadour of Knowledge, as we know it in English, uh, was published in 1991, that's four years after statues, but of course before the origins of geometry, so it sits between the two. Uh, there's so many betweens in this paper that it would have been tedious to mark them all up. <laughs> So thirdly, uh, important for me, alongside this notion of a parallelogram of forces and the notion of the excluded third, um, is the notion of series. A notion of series as open-ended and incompletable, which then mo modulates, I think, into the notion of translation to unexpected arrivals or swerves in thinking, uh, some due to translation and some due to the matter itself. Stephen Connor, in his wise introduction to the English translation of the five senses of philosophy of mingled bodies, which in French came out in 1985 and in English, I guess, in 1997, draws attention to a form of incomplete and open-ended series and to the importance for Serre of a phrase from the address to John Locke, Nihil est in intellectu quod non fuerit in sensu, excipe nise ipse intellectus, which goes into English as there's nothing in the intellect which was not first in the senses, that's the bit attributable to John Locke, nothing in the intellect which was not first in the senses with the addition of the phrase then, except and unless it be the intellect itself. This phrase as emblem may usefully sit alongside Heidegger's claim in being and time concerning the distinctiveness of Dasein Das Dasein had sein sein zu sein, which really doesn't go into English at all, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> well, it's multiple deployments of the term sein and the intimation that grammatically the term sein is underway from nominalized and abstract form to a verbal reappropriation and materialization in a determinate location. I think that was what I found so interesting and exciting when I first read Being in Time, that it seemed to me that the abstract was being rendered material. Um, and then I found that almost nobody else read Being in Time like that, so I thought maybe I'd better migrate out of Heidegger studies, but uh, these notions of biography and autobiography. Anyway, moving briefly uh, to some way of not concluding my remarks, uh, my third section, Rome, Statues, Geometry, instead of Philosophy of History. A contrast between monolithic and dispersive readings of history, of fate and of destiny, disrupted by notions of chance and by the clinamen of an original deviation, calls for shifting back from the framing through Leibniz and Heidegger, an encounter between the monad and Dasein, to an exchange and conversation with Foucault and Epistemes and his pursuit of genealogy, an encounter with Deleuze's unfolds and multiplicities. So in place of a determinate existing Dasein and the unity of an entity given as a substance, a simple substance as monad, Serre in Genesis in 1982 draws attention to thinking points of departure as multiplicity and to thinking the multiple as such a quotation which unfortunately, oh yes, here it is, good. Uh, phew, that's a relief. <laughs> uh, so here is my last, um, and I hope in focus, bringing citation. And I think I, I can occupy the eye here. I think, I think um, well, can I stand in for Sarah? I'm attempting to think time. I'm well aware that time has no unity, no moment, no instant, no beginning, no end, and that I have no knowledge of its eternal completeness. For all the times that I've been able to tell, all of them were unities. I'm now attempting to think time as pure multiplicity. Thus, perhaps, history can be born. History is in the midst of these hazy in-betweens, commonly lived, uneasily thought. It is... As it happens, information neither total nor null, without a clear-cut boundary between the observer and the observed. Like the observer, it's full of sound and fury. A meditation on pure multiplicity, this book, Genesis, is seeking beyond the sea, the plain, the branch of the river, noise, hate time, seeking a philosophy of history. 
The multiple is the object of this book, and history is its goal. Well, it seems to me that between kind of 1982 and hominescence in 2001, that maybe uh, history is no longer the goal, that hominescence is the manner in which he can respond to the task that he set himself back in Genesis from 1982. The book bears an epitaph from Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, which I think is worth marking up. And it marks a departure for Serre into a different kind of writing from that which he has uh, been uh, accustomed to make use of. And this kind of writing continues to pose considerable challenges to its would-be reader, I guess, even for those who are reading it in French, but certainly for those who are trying to read it in translation into English. These departures and shifts of focus mark up a disaggregating of bodies as much as their mingling, and is signalled by Nietzsche's many names of history, by the insistence on Dionysian metamorphosis, and by the core melee of the subtitle of the 1985 book on the senses, not so much mingled bodies, which is how it comes into English, as dispersed bodies. In the telling of the history of the philosophy over the past 30 years, various figures have become embalmed. It becomes a problem that they may become monumentalized, and I'm wary that this sad fate should happen to Michel Serre. The task is to breathe new life into them by insisting on conversation and dialogue as indeed, of course, Deleuze has done in generating the notion of conceptual personae out of the figures in the history of philosophy important for him, Spinoza, Nietzsche, Bergson. Serre does the same. He prevents a certain kind of monumentalizing and embalming by opening the history of philosophy up to a closer connection to the histories of both science and of religion. And maybe my proposal then to think a modification of the series, Spinoza, Nietzsche, Bergson, Deleuze, as Spinoza and Leibniz, Nietzsche and Heidegger, Deleuze and Serre will have to go by way of a reading of Bergson and Bachelard. <laughs> In parallel, there is, of course, a pursuit of this series, monads and Dasein, statues and nomads, foundations and multiplicities, points and folds, and in a previously sketched version of this paper, I got on to talking about Deleuze and Serre on folds, and that's not going to happen today. Uh, furthermore, there's this move beyond an either-or between either seeking out origins and foundations, some kind of nostalgia for a never-existing past, or positing some kind of future towards which one might be orienting oneself, rather insisting with Sarah on a switch mechanism to disrupt both the temptations of expectations concerning a future and such nostalgic returns to falsely imagined origins. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, again, a very rich, rich paper. Um, do we have questions, comments? Okay, I'll start. Um, thanks, Joanna. I was really pleased that you invoked the figure of Thumbelina at the start of the paper, um, although, uh, yeah, because she, I think, kind of, she's the embodiment or the actor that we've travelled, we can think to travel with through what we've uh, heard this morning. Um, perhaps she's the, she's the actor that's animating all the different modes of being or kind of ways in which you might uh, be required to navigate contemporary reality or the cosmos, uh, as um, uh, Roberto was talking about. Um, but it's it, it's this question of movement that your paper raised that I think is interesting. And I just I wonder if you could say more about um, this movement of the message, which perhaps is in that middle, the middle foundation book that. Uh, Sarah's kind of drawing on like the actual statue and mobility as a way, <laughs> the mobility or the immobility of the figure today that we, Thumbelina, how we use to navigate the data sets of the world and the knowledge of the world or 
these places that, uh, you know, they only exist as we move through them or, or become them or, um, as a question from the previous paper um, pointed out, uh, what's the relationship between embodiment um, and mnemonics? So it's a question of mobility and the movement. Is that the nomadology part of the paper that you steered away from? Well, the temptation would be to put those abstractly and then mobile and then mobility is mobility itself. But of course, um, that's on. Sorry. <laughs> Why don't I stand by the microphone? <laughs> um, two, rem two remarks in response. Um, it's important to notice that it would be a trap to set up as opposed statues as immobile and uh, nomadology as mobile, because it seems to me that in the intervening 25, however many years since What is Philosophy was published, nomadology has become monumentalized in a certain kind of way, um, and um, uh, the appeal of thinking, mobility, movement, everything changes, um, is not thinking that everything changes. <laughs> um, and so I would not want to go down the route of um, opposing them. It seems to me that the nomadology, in a sense, becomes a statue to emblematize what was the promise of a certain conjuncture between Deleuze and Gattari, which was of a moment which is no longer of the same kind as it was when they were thinking it, one of them now dead and the other writing separately. So um, it seems to me that what's interesting in the Thumbelina image is that it's just the two thumbs. And of course, when mobile phones first came in, it was the two thumb gesture of game consoles. I mean, these days we hold mobile phones in one hand and use um, a single digit, but of course, for I think Sal, what's interesting about Petit Poussette is that it's two thumbs being used ambidextrously. And he's exceptionally interested in the problem of us becoming one-sided, that we're either left-handed or right-handed. And he returns on a number of occasions to say, oh, don't forget I'm left-handed and I had it beaten out of me <laughs> when I was in school and I now don't know which hand to lead with. Um, so uh, I think Thumbelina is even more interesting. Um, uh, I mean, clearly the appeal to a 13-year-old female child has a kind of resonance to the child who turns up in Nietzsche's um, discussions. But that it's a female child seems to me to show that Sarah is hearing some kind of problem about the spaces that assume we enter as human being <laughs> and the spaces that notice that we recognize as um, uh, differentiatedly embodied. And some kind of notion of uh, aging, it seems to me Michelle Serre has managed to insert into the way in which the later writings arrive, which maybe should be taken back and put into the books that I was reading from the 80s and early 90s. It's not obvious to me that it's so clear that he's got this sense of the changing nature of human embodiment over the lifespan. Um, so the invocation of the 13-year-old girl child by the 70-year-old <coughs> male philosopher uh, is a kind of interesting move which could problematically turned back into some kind of Rousseau-esque Sophie, but I take it uh, we can read it in a different kind of way in order precisely to ask what happens, as we were talking about in the break, what happens when instead of talking about minimo technics, we talk about minimo somatics, the way in which the body remembers certain kinds of physiological transformationary experiences. Um, I could... Um, talk about the bike accident, but maybe we should save that for the break. <laughs> um, I don't think, um, I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I think the question about the sexual difference in relation to sale, which I kind of feel is maybe behind your question somewhere, I don't think I'm ready to address that, but if you have more to say about that, that would be great. 
Yeah, maybe it's, maybe actually this is a similar thing I want to ask you. I, there is, so now when you were describing with San Berina, I think this is very, very important. It's the two sums. It's the parallelity of actions, which are somehow symmetrical and yet not in the same, in one time, yeah, kind of, but forming one time together. But then what I don't understand, and I was puzzled by, by I, I very much liked your talk, but I was puzzled by the role that you give the series for organizing your talk, because it seems to me that it contradicts what you try to foreground, actually. So maybe you, could you say more about your fascination with series as a form to address uh, these things? Well spotted. Uh, I think the, the section on grammar and order um, imposed itself on me as I began to worry about having selected series out. But it was so helpful to me to select out the term series for attention because it allows me first to set up one account of how the history of philosophy is supposed to work and then propose, as you say, you know, the other thumb um, uh, marks out a different series of names for a different kind of history of philosophy. And then it turns out that you have to oscillate back and forth between the two series and you don't have a single unified series if you say Leibniz and Spinoza, Nietzsche and Heidegger, um, Bergson and Bachelor. You can't unite that into a single unified series. You've got a syncopation between the two um, and the notion of series will begin to tend to collapse and then of course if you try to think about the way in which our sense of grammar um, can't really collapse because if it does we stop being able to make sense to each other um, and our notion of time um, I've been enjoying the fact that it's been saying 7.15 ever since we arrived um, and when Greg said that you know maybe we can't disrupt the temporal spatial order in the same way we can tear up maps it struck me that stopping the clock at quarter past seven <laughs> was quite an ingenious way of reminding us that uh, our sense of order in terms of temporal series is something that's so uh, uh, ground into us from kind of the age of three onwards. Getting back to a time before that sense of time was so ground into us, I think, is exceptionally difficult. I mean, that's why the image of getting back to a 13-year-old is already a leap of imagination that I find hard. <laughs> uh, and to get back to a time before we had such a strong sense of chronological order, I mean, I guess that's the second feature of reading Heidegger as opposed to the analytical philosophy I was brought up in that I found so exceptionally rewarding, the way in which he uh, uh, sets up this sedimented notion of times and temporalities which do not permit of any easy way of resynchronizing them into a syncretic whole. So I found that uh, aspect of it similarly uh, engaging. But, but the idea that there are two thumbs and an asymmetry and that one will come out more powerfully than the other and that you have to make an effort to get the other one to function, I think is also uh, a feature of Sayre's writings which you can see himself as he writes, trying to remember about the things that he's, in fact, necessarily excluding. Um, so the ideal of a non-excluded third uh, turns out to be harder to actualise um, along the same lines, that you tend to be always on the one hand or on the other and not on the both. Universal human being. I mean, you are petite poussette, I am petite poussette, we, we all are. And it's not a book about 13 uh, year old girls. Uh, so uh, the, the, the fact that um, she's a girl, the, this symbol of humanity is a girl, sh 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 um, it, uh, queries our own pre prejudices. Why shouldn't we pick a woman as a symbol of humanity? And why shouldn't we pick a child? that we usually view as an unfinished human being as uh, the best representative of what humanity is. <laughs> 
my hunch is that one of the things that we're required there to think is the notion of finishedness, um, and that a certain speed up compression uh, technical capacity of th three and five year olds. I mean, it's not 13 year olds now, it's three and five year olds who know how to use the technology in the household better than I do. Um, and that kind of notion that the facility, um, that the um, technical competencies of people under the age of 25 um, make the notion of a single species problematical <laughs> because those of us who are you know, on sticks and uh, of an older generation do not have the same sense of how meanings and figures and uh, digital uh, digitization uh, affects their, the interstices of their daily lives. I mean, I, I watch student bodies with you know, fascination because of the different ways in which they sit in classrooms and the way in which in the intervening generation students sat in classrooms. And it seems to me that this notion of hominescence permits us to think the degree of transformation, the metamorphosis of the species, I think is a phrase I have in there somewhere, but I wouldn't be able to find it now. Um, and that strikes me as interestingly contrastive both to whatever it is that the Renaissance is doing in relation to the figure of man um, and whatever our invocations of the Renaissance in relation to the figure of man might be about that there is this very strongly contrastive um, um, way of thinking either a static image of humanity, um, that I think of that um, the figure of the human being male in the circle, it's Leonardo as it's drawn, I should have it up here shouldn't I, um, as opposed to maybe the illustration in Petit Pousset, uh, that would make a good um, final frame. Thank you very much, I shall use that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> If we don't have any more questions, um, we will now have a break for lunch and we will rejoin here at 2.30 precisely <laughs> for the last um, talk of our session on mnemotechnics. Um, 